time, Igor. Uh, there is two ways to pronounce it. One is to say Igor, which is, sounds a bit weird and creepy. And then the other one is like you say, the, there's a verb eager, and it's like more close, but yeah, Igor is also fine. Uh, funny thing, Igor in Swedish is yesterday. So I tend to joke that I'm always yesterday when that, yeah. So a few years I was doing computer computations and in that field you do a lot of uh, Fortran uh, development and uh, some simulations of uh, quantum mechanics involve running stuff on multiple computers, multiple nodes, specifically designed systems, like very hard stuff that you don't really want to mess with. Once it works, it works. But all the outside data processing and uh, visualization you can easily do with Python, that's perfectly fine. Uh, the talk would contain a bit of uh, misinformation, but uh, I don't think that's important. The general idea should still hold. I'm, as English is my second language, I'm very bad at sticking a single uh, style of uh, writing words, and I'm also dyslexic a bit, so sometimes I just mix letters at random and don't see that, so if you feel like something is weird on the slide and you don't think that it should be written this way, like, uh, for example, the word biscuit, uh, then uh, you should be aware that it was not intended. I'm a huge fan of octopuses, Irish ciders, and uh, I've seen a few McDonough plays. I'm not sure if I'm writing his name right. So uh, it's funny that uh, it's my first time in Dublin, and when I uh, get in a cab in the airport, the driver was very chatty, and I just felt like uh, I'm in one of his <laughs> movies or the place. It was uh, very funny. Yeah, uh, I would like to challenge that I'm the tallest person around here. If you think that you're taller than me, we can talk later. Yeah, uh, what I'm going to talk about, I would like to talk about what are actually task queues and what are they used for, and why you might need one. Uh, I'll discuss some libraries that are usually used for this, and uh, people must only use Celery, or like know that Celery exists, but actually there are a few others, and my main idea of this talk is to let you know that there are other amazing libraries to look into. And uh, as I noticed, a lot of data scientists kind of stuck in the way of doing Python development inside the Jupyter notebooks or inside the PyCharm. And sometimes you just want them to go beyond. And uh, maybe it's uh, somewhat uh, in parallel of what was discussed yesterday with MVP moving to proper things that sometimes you just need to, the process to be more streamlined or more parallelized or something like that. So this is one of the ideas why that. So feel free to interrupt me at any point and ask questions. I'm not sure if this will work, uh, but I need a, like a confirmation note from a volunteer that you're okay with bringing the uh, mic. No, yes, yeah, yeah, okay. So yeah, I'll see if anyone raises hands and uh, we'll see, yeah. Uh, but in any case, if you have, questions afterwards, feel free to find me uh, somewhere here. Since I'm tall, I'm very easy to find. So in the wild, we have different flavors of uh, parallel computing. If we talk a lot of data, but not many computations, usually we go with uh, some noise curl solutions to store the data and some ELT transformations, and maybe if you're uh, lucky, you get some map reduced situations that are balanced in a way that all the data is stored properly, so your computations actually don't take much time, but you have lots of data, so you can parallelize it on the spot. Uh, if you have lots of data and lots of calculations, usually go with some ETL tool like Spark, or you start writing stuff in Scala because you think that this would be faster, or you use some MPP like Redshift or some other tools that you have to write a proper code in a properly thinking about your data and the way it is computed. In uh, the category that I call others, there are other solutions that sort of limited to either one machine when you go with CUDA or like some very interconnected things or maybe combination of those two when you have uh, different places like card calculations but maybe not so much data and then um, doing things like you pass it around and then you have different type of workers and so on. So what I'm going to talk is mainly the first two uh, situations when you have some data, so and then you have some processes that process them, but maybe not something weird. So probably if you have some weird situation, 
the Dusk queue will not help you, but for the first two, it might. Anyone here used Dusk ever? For some, yeah, okay. So in my opinion, Dusk is a nice, uh, Dusk is a Python version of Spark, basically, but it's very, uh, not fresh, or, or, or rather, not, not ready yet for commercial use. So let's talk specific. Imagine you write some code, you make it work, and you really want to make it run faster. So what do you have as a possibilities to achieve that? Uh, first of all, you can say that, well, I will use multi-threading, but then you, talk, you hear someone saying that, well, Python has GIL, so your multi-threading would not work as you expected. And it's kind of true, but kind of not, and it's a lot of things happening in this field, especially since like recent development of 3.11, and uh, there was some change between Python 2, Python 3, and then Python 3.2, Python 3.3, and there's a lot of stuff. So it's like, if you go there, you spend a couple of days trying to make your code uh, work faster, and in the end it sort of runs the same, and you, you know much more now, but it doesn't help you, so it's very annoying. If you go multiprocessing instead, which is like a solution that you often find on Stack Overflow that you don't use multi-threading, you use multiprocessing, then it works. Uh, it's still a bit funky. It's, you can make it work, but you will need to rewrite some of your code. Modern people say that uh, uh, async uh, development would help you, but what I found is that once you actually have, in this particular situation, when you have some code already running, already doing what you want, and you just want to make it run faster, if you try to use uh, async for just some part of this code, it won't work, because you will start to feel like it uh, it's like calls to your inner deep desires to just rewrite everything to be uh, async. So it's very contagious. Once you start adding async to your program, if, it's not, it, if it was not there from the beginning, you would feel like it sort of uh, pollutes your code base and uh, can, makes everything asynchronous. So sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes you just have like this particular function, you understand that you want to run this function maybe not on the whole data set, but just split it in parts and like write it multiple times. And you, why you can't do this? And there's where the task queues are coming to play. So task queues is uh, basically some systems that um, you can say they can be distributed and uh, they consist of a few things. So first of all, it's a task queue, so there's a queue. Then there's a task, and task is some definition of something that needs to be done with a uh, defined result. So it can be a result from a function. Defined piece of work is typically some code, and it needs to pr pr be processed somewhere. And then there's some task ordering and dependency management, like this task needs to be run after this one, this task needs to be waiting for this one, and uh, like this three needs to be run in particular order or something like that, so there's some mechanism for that. And you want to monitor like if your task is running right, if it's dead, if you need to retry it, and so on and so forth. These three, uh, no, not three, but these things usually are realized uh, in different ways, but they might be named differently, but usually you can say that there's a broker, this one tool that keeps like the work parts that you need to do, and uh, those uh, all the management. Then there's a worker who does all the heavy lifting, and then there's so-called customers or submit scripts that you basically have to put, uh, you tell broker that I want this to be done, and uh, maybe I want some workers, particular workers to do it. If you take Python and task queue, it's a great idea because Python has GUI and uh, CPU heavy task can be, well, you can say that they can't utilize threads properly. This is like a very, it needs to have like five stars uh, on top to, because you need to talk about every word here, so just go with it, okay? Uh, technically, GIL forces you to have one proper computational thread per process, and task use has basically allowing each worker that has its own uh, process running in its own process and technically making it so that each worker would have its own GIL, so you sort of uh, evade this problem. And then you can say that, well, if you do it right, you can say that task blocks can be achieved some consistency, like in the way that there is some parts that works here, then they come here to work on that, and if you do that in multi-threading, you'll have to deal with some mutex like blocking, and it's, it's not fun. Or it is, but uh, maybe it's not what you want to be spending your time with. So if you talk about task, you usually have something like that. You have a thing that stores your results, uh, the backend here, 
in the bottom. Um, you have some workers that pick the work from the task queue, and then there's a broker that sort of stores all the works that needs to be done. So here we have different uh, places where we store results, which can be like a database or some other location, and then you have a broker that sort of uh, allows you to tell like, there's the list of things you need to be doing, and then workers come there, they pick the thing, they do the work, they put it in the back end, and uh, hopefully everyone happy in the end. When we talk about web context, usually you have uh, particular instruments to do it. You have some Redis instance that uh, uh, has salary, and then salary uses the broker and uh, uh, result storage as Redis, or sometimes something else. And then you have some workers, and it's like a separate entity inside your ecosystem when you have your traditional Django web application, for example, uh, that you have database, and then this cluster of doing these particular works. Um, if we talk theoretical stuff, we can say that there is a thing called Adam's law, Amdal's law, yeah. And it says that if you have some particular part of your program that you can never parallelize, like it's some, it needs to be done sequential, you cannot reach uh, speed up higher than a particular number. Uh, the actual formula is on the slide. It's basically some proportions, and let's look at, uh, look at the particular example. Suppose you have a task and you make it run in 24 hours. Um, on a single worker or like single core. And there is like two hours of work that needs to just to set up everything, to just like to do sequential work, wait for all the stuff to be prepared, like maybe a long file that needs to be processed line by line, by line or something like that. And uh, out of these 24 hours, you have 22. So only a particular part of, those, uh, of your work can be paralyzed. The thing is that due to the fact that you have these two hours in the beginning, the Amdahl's law says that even if you utilize all the cores you can get, you cannot go beyond like 12 times faster than your original code. You have to rewrite some part of it, like maybe use a different version of the algorithm or something, and then you can achieve higher uh, scalability. But like the theoretical limit of this particular law says that there is a cap, you cannot go beyond. So even if you like throw all the, all the things you have, you will never achieve like more uh, performance than you want. So you need to keep in mind that there is, a, there is some sequential sections that you cannot get away from. And this is a very unlocking in a sense that um, when we think about parallel execution, we think that, well, actually I need to write everything in parallel. This is like what asyncio tricks you into doing that because you start think that, well, I need to do everything right. This particular law just said, like, well, there is a part that you just can't do right. You have to keep the way that they are sequential. And then there are some parts that you can probably parallelize. And when you would use Python, actually, with these task queues, when you want the process to be done remotely, like you have some different hardware, maybe there's a very expensive uh, GPU server that you want to send the work there and then come back with the result, but you don't want to be running it on your MacBook Air. And you want to have some processing that is done parallel in a process wise. So there's multiple processes doing somewhat similar thing, and you have it somewhere there. And uh, well, it's a very cheap way to run your code sort of asynchronously because you don't have to rewrite it in the sense that it's technically task you allow you to, it is very little uh, care, move your stuff to something that is more scalable. And of course, we will inevitably spend some time preparing the data. And it is like the, that particular part of Amdon Slow that you cannot get away with. Let's zoom in with, with, if you talk about this, it's very important that you'd say that, well, we spent some time sending over the network, uh, over the network to the broker, which got me thinking that, well, over the net, if we just relax this particular thing, maybe we can get better. So let's look at, uh, at some timings. Uh, there is some scaled uh, version of what typically happens and what, uh, what time it takes. So if you, have, if you say that you have a CPU, and one CPU cycle stays like 0.3 nanoseconds, it's technically, let's say, in human time, it's one second, and it's, it's very hard to blink faster than one per second, but you can try, uh, especially with one eye. If you just take a, a look at what, what there's different levels of uh, data 
stored in the processor and they can be clothed to the processor and further away. And if we go like to the next one, this will be like very close cache, but very small one. So it's just tiny, it's like a bit uh, more like three seconds in terms of human time. If you, if you talk about like next cache, it's a bit bigger, but then it takes longer to, to get there. If you know like the speed of light, uh, you can sort of map it to real human thing. This, the nanosecond light travels like this distance, basically one feet, one foot, and uh, you just can't go faster than that if you have to do a lot of changes. Like if you ever seen like the processor, it has a lot of turns, so it uh, loses some time doing that. So level two takes about the same amount of like jump in a shot. Uh, if you take uh, talk about level three cache, maybe it's. Uh, if you're very, very hurry to enjoy Pint. And then uh, if you go like main memory access out of this particular optimized stuff that probably you never have to deal with when you write in Python because you don't know how this optimized, uh, you most of the time you might deal with like mem main memory access that is just your RAM and then it's a uh, well, couple of beers and 120 nanoseconds. So you, you can go quite far just by miss, um, management where you access your memory. And if you deal like with low level computations, you have to take that into account. But if you like deal with Python, probably that's not something you think about us like, uh, and if we talk about more real things that solid uh, state disk or rotational disk or like sending stuff from the net from Dublin to Milano, it might take 40 milliseconds, which in the same scale would be like four years. So very long time. And just going from Dublin to South Pole would make like the same time as this uh, more, more, more years than the PyCon Ireland been running or like uh, something like that. So very long time. So you don't want to do it, but you can sort of trick yourself into saying that, well, I would like to stay on the same machine and then I will use my uh, local network, which is a bit like trick cheating and uh, not really true in a sense that you will still have to send some, some data over there, but it will be not four years, but maybe like uh, one month in the same uh, agreement, but still you would have more nicer uh, probability. So you can run local uh, Redis uh, broker with a simple line. And if you have Docker, it would be nice and it will be working like fast and nice. So if you just use that, then you can stay on the same machine and most of machines have multiple cores and you can run multiple workers there. So there are tools that help you do that and uh, with task queue you can say that, well, if I send an email from a web service, this probably when I don't want to wait because I send the user that he sent the mail or he or she and then it gets back but the factual email setting can become later. If I get generate reports, I'm based on data that I can tell users that your report is getting done I'll get back to you and basically anytime you need to provide the result, but the result can be sent later, you would use the task queue. That's like the official idea of when you would do that in a web development context. In reality, if you do some computational, whether data or not, you can say that, well, any embarrassingly parallel task can be used that. What's embarrassingly parallel? It's when you actually have uh, the part of your code that can be parallelized in the sense that, well, uh, just take more workers and it would be this uh, splittable Part. So you have some big data set that you can just like cut, maybe with slides or with window functions, and just work on that part, and that would be basically as much parts that you have, the, the biggest speed up would be. So this would be like the parallel part. If you can speed, uh, notice that in your code, then this will work. The disadvantage is obviously that you need to prepare the data, you need to send it to worker, and the harder it gets, the less likely you will uh, try to do it. Your worker will need some resources. So in the uh, context of um, slides I showed a few a while ago with Celery, you typically have like a static cluster that has some resources there, but uh, it takes some uh, time to get there and to some care be taken about those. And need a way to monitor those task states. Technically, you can write this all in Python and it just might take you around 100 lines of code, like really, like, okay, maybe 200. If you look at some of the implementations of the um, utilities I will talk later, you can see that it's quite a short piece of code and you can actually read it because it's written by normal people and not Java developers. And then uh, in that sense, just don't do that because there are already people who, do, who did it and technically everything is queue if you're brave enough. If you have your data system or uh, like SQL, we can just say like, well, I want to fetch events 
I want to order them by timestamp, and I just want the top one, and just that's it. And then you can say, look, well, yeah, of course, but you want to be able to reschedule some failed stuff, you want to be able to scale number of workers, and when you start doing that, it clearly becomes understandable that you need more than just uh, 100 lines. So the classical one is Celery. I will now show a few examples of code, and out of the box, it's very optimized for very small tasks that happens in uh, web development. Like, you run stuff that is, needs to be uh, return response really fast, but then actual things happen somewhere there, but it's not really computationally expensive. It's very hard to tune it for more or less like generalized solution. You can have a cluster that does one particular thing really great, but other sets not, not that great. And, uh, well, if, you, if and only if you can sell your soul to config gods, you will get some multiple supported brokers that will be nice, that will be working nicely, and you can chain the task with complexity, and there's a lot of things you can do with salary that is nice. If you say that uh, I don't know salary, I want to do something, then time, time to solution to that particular problem would be say that, well, you can achieve some competence with working with salary in a few weeks, uh, or several. And then there would be like a few like, why, ah, moments that would count you for like a few months when you work with salary. This would be very annoying and uh, it's like tricky versioning, just like terrible. But it works and it's most uh, complex and most uh, uh, experienced system there is. So typically you define salary, piece of salary code like this, you have an app, uh, you have some name, you say that this is my broker, this is my backend, this is how I want to connect here, here I'm using Redis for everything. I say that, well, I want to define a couple of tasks that I want to be running, this task is called multiplication, this task is more like save, save division, it's like division as uh, I think the pony language actually uses the same notation for regular division, that if you divide by zero, you just return zero. And, um, if you schedule these tasks, then you have to write a separate piece of code that is just like, this is a customer, the other one there is like a worker, I don't know, the contract, and uh, if you just run here, just like that, you will see that when you run the script, it will hang on the line with the puddle, uh, because it will wait there for some time until like someone actually gets this work done. Uh, then you just launch a salary worker, you say that, well, there is my uh, contract, the script, and it will just tell you that you can see that there are some lines when uh, it says which uh, task it can be running, and then it uh, sort of tells you what to do. And you can have like multiple workers doing that, multiple configurations, like nice requests. So just looks very simple, just simple lines of code. If you can even chain your task together, like you say you want multiply something, but then you want to divide it, and then you connect them together, it's just nice. But everything beyond this is a bit complicated, and uh, sometimes you have particular backends that works only for, uh, for the things that you need. You need to use particular backends, and then it won't work with the worker that you have. So I would say that Celery is very optimized for very small, not long-running tasks, uh, specifically for web tasks, and it's more traditional in a sense that you want to have a separate Celery cluster in your ecosystem that's like, this is the thing I'm running, this is like, few machines that connected together and they do things, and I have external monitoring on them, and when I send stuff there, it's some, something happens. I have yet to see some person who is not terribly hating salary, uh, at least once <laughs> when working with them, so if, if someone is very amazed by salary, please raise your hand. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I will try to avoid you, or, <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> okay, yes, but uh, there is a very simple library called Redis Q. It's just what it is, it's Redis Q, because of the fact that it's a very simple, single broker, single uh, result storage. It's very simple code. You can use it, uh, it, it has a very simple like bootstrap written dashboard, and it's great because the much simpler, the simpler code base is uh, more assumptions you can make when you write in it, and it's very nice, very easy, and I would say that if you want to do something like that with tasks Q and Python, it will take you maybe a couple of days to learn like the very basics, or maybe even faster, and then a couple of weeks to catch all the potential gotchas and just see what, how things are working. So uh, let's take a look at a couple of code examples, and uh, this is the RQ, like the part with, where I submit stuff. So this is like a, I say, well, well, there is some process function that I want to run, and then I enqueue this function, and then Basically, that's it. I don't need to define specifically uh, the process function to be something like the task or some particular things here. I just say that I want to, these jobs being queued, and while this job result is not 
uh, done. I will just wait and check again. So it's very simple, very small code. Once you run the worker for this, it will work if, if it has the same Python pass. There are some minor things, that, but it's very easy that it's, uh, every exception it says, it's like very simple and to understand it, but maybe like you will shoot yourself a couple of times in the foot when you run it, but it will work like very fast and you will be happy. And if you look at the Redis, uh, how it stores things, this is one of the uh, solutions with a different input, yeah, and the different functions, but uh, doesn't matter. You can see that there are some data blocks, there are some blobs of data and the names of the functions that you need to run, and like what would be the particular result. And then uh, if you run worker, it will go to this particular radius instance, it will see that, oh, I have this piece of work in this queue, I want to do this, I want to run it, and then you will get some result. Is everything fine? Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. So then what I tend to do is I actually create a small uh, system there uh, unit on my machine. And uh, then I have like some environment stored and then have some uh, particular path where it needs to be run. And of course, like if you have multiple projects, you would probably want to change it, but it's, it makes you very easy in a situation where I just wrote a piece of code, I have this particular function, and I want to write it, uh, like run it for different inputs fast. I don't want to just like iterate it over here, I just want to like, how would I do it? I will just change this particular snippet, and then I will do some basic uh, bash uh, manipulation, like I run 20 workers, and then I can change, check the status and everything. And it's like, it's very simple to write uh, this sort of uh, system D units. It might look terrible if you, that's the first time you're looking at it, but it's actually, there's only maybe three or four important lines here. The, basically, the type of service, the, what, what you run, and um, maybe what are the environment variables. And then, of course, you can say that, well, RQ is not the only one. There are other tools like that. Like, I, I, I already said that there's Celery, and if you, if you like RQ, because it has a very simple, very, like, Unix way type of thing. I do this thing, I do it only with Redis, that's all I can do, that's it. It's very simple. If you want something else, if you, or you don't like RQ for some reason, you can try Huey. Uh, I personally don't think I can pronounce that name properly, so I don't use that. <laughs> and then there is a cool tool called Dramatic, which is, I think, written by the someone who hates Celery. Uh, and uh, it has a very nice list of motivation. Why would you use that instead of... Uh, um, other tools, and it sort of a, a bit a bit more con configurable than Arcu. But if you manage working with Arcu, you will get a very swift uh, transition to dramatic, and then you have a bit more options to work with. But it's like very simple, very easy to monitor, very easy to understand. So if I would start a project from scratch, I highly recommend looking into dramatic if you have some experience. If you just want to get your feet wet with Task Q, try Arcu. It's great. Uh, yeah, but that's basically it. All the links uh, from, the, from this can be found on the first uh, link here. But uh, if you want to get in touch, uh, find me as Shrimp Size Moose on any social networks. Uh, we cancel in Twitter today, so, but you can find me there. And yeah, I do a podcast about data engineering, and uh, I recently started writing some Kotlin uh, with no prior experience, uh, but aside from Python, you can watch me write some Kotlin on Twitch every Friday. That's all I wanted to talk, and I would like gladly answer a few questions, if there are any. Hi, yeah, nice presentation. Um, I had a question about, you know, do you have any experience uh, of using uh, you know, workers, instead of using workers, which essentially, you know, spin up the whole process again, you know, use the whole data again. Do you have any experience using async for, you know, data science models? Uh, yes, and uh, no, in a sense, uh, I will, uh, so yeah. I use async a lot when I deliver data science stuff to production. So when I already have it simulated, then I like, I stop modeling and then I go with like, okay, now I need to make this work. And then I basically go into a situation when I write everything from scratch and then I can use anything I want, like the async database packages, which is a really nice tool, and uh, then it's fine. So I try to separate these parts or like change the hats when I'm working on that. 
or did you have any success in actually executing some data science model in an asynchronous fashion? Or is it more like just doing the API work and the database work that is async? No, no, we succeeded, but it was not pleasant and tricky, yeah. All right, yeah, thanks. It was a very fun project when we had to uh, compare our solution with, uh, I think, Vopal Webit. So we used uh, the same tool to query either Vopal Webit or other, our stuff, and it was, yeah, <laughs> dreadful. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, if I don't want, for some reason, to deploy uh, Redis, if I have just a, a small uh, command line script that has to do something in parallel, uh, can, can I use another broker, like just a memory broker? With one oh, of the tools? that's a good question. No, I don't think. Well, then I would say that uh, you probably want to try using threads and uh, things like that, if you really want to do it this way. But uh, yeah. For me, every time, threads is like advanced SQL for me. When I forget, when I don't use it every day, I tend to forget a lot. And then when I, I'm running into the same issues every time I have to do thread uh, computing, as well as write complex SQL, yeah. So let me count from five to one, and if we don't see any question, then we will finish the session. Five, four, three, two, one, yay, nice. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>